question was a great segue on a number of uh, topics that he touched upon. And uh, what I'll try to do in, uh, during this hour, and then I have a number of other sessions tomorrow, is essentially to walk you through of which statistical techniques uh, we use without getting into too many details of you know, how we think uh, when we're interested in processing metabolomics data. Chuck had a number of um, different plots in uh, his uh, presentation. He talked about um, changes in the lipidome or the metabolome for, uh, between different diets. He had a very complex experimental design, and I'll walk you through a little bit. I have another case study which has a much simpler experimental design. And then towards the end of his talk, Chuck started showing you networks. So I'll give you a feeling of how we go about and calculate those networks, what information they give you, what statistical quantities they're based on. And, uh, and then we'll wrap up with some thoughts about data integration, since I know that this is an important topic of how you integrate omics data. Here we're talking primarily about metabolomics and lipidomics, but in most cases you may have some additional omic source like RNA-seq and so on and so forth. And of course that's a very hot topic right now, but I just want just to give you a flavor. Um, so the other thing is, I think uh, Ala mentioned that somebody wanted uh, mentioned some, that they want to see some information about power analysis. I don't have slides right now, but I'll make some slides overnight and I'll spend about 10, 15 minutes talking about power analysis. So if there are any other requests that you would like me to cover since I have quite a bit of time tomorrow, please ask Allah or communicate directly with me and we'll take it from there. All right, so uh, here, you know, after all these things have taken place and previous uh, presentations have covered all these other boxes. Somehow the data have been obtained and right now you're trying sort of to analyze them. And then once you start getting insights, uh, start thinking about interpretation and further exploration. Uh, but, you know, before start talking about our statistical analysis, I would like uh, sort of to always pay attention to the study design that was covered by Anna Matthews yesterday, and also how we need to think a little bit about the data. Uh, Charles uh, yesterday and Maureen and TM later today are gonna talk of how the data are acquired, but you know, once we get the data, you know, how to do a little bit of pre-processing uh, to make sure that everything is kosher before we start doing uh, statistical analysis. So as a general reference about the workflow of how we think the moment, you know, the core passes data to us until we get all the way to pathway enrichment that Allah is gonna show you a number of tools uh, tomorrow. Uh, this is a nice uh, review paper that we wrote with uh, um, Allah and uh, Sub and uh, Sub's postdoc, Kelly. So, you know, if you would like sort of to see, and it's still um, fairly up to date, there haven't been that many new developments. So, I'm gonna use two case studies to walk you through in order sort of to be able to refer to some real data. Chuck just finished discussing this case study, and as I pointed out, this has a fairly complex experimental design. And, uh, you know, depends on what you're trying sort of to find out, the statistical modeling here becomes fairly involved. And as you can see, the other big challenge that you have is that you don't have enough uh, subjects. So you are sample size deprived. You have 10 controls and five uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease subjects. And then you put two diets, that, you know, the two diets that uh, Chuck showed you and on top of that, you also have um, time course data. So this is a really complex design because one subject that is on, let's say the PUFA diet, you get measurements over four time points and then you switch them to a diet and you continue taking again another three measurements. So for every subject you have seven measurements. So you may be interested in various questions. 
whether there were changes within the same diet from the baseline to day 21. Or another question that you may want to ask is, what happened at day two being on the PUFA diet and what happens at day two being on the carb diet? That's another question. Or another even more complicated question is, uh, what are the differences <clears throat> between the two diets on day two and between the two groups? So you can see. And the other thing that here, this is a complicated design, and here you need to be careful of how you model and analyze the data because the effects are nested. There are hierarchies of how the design uh, has been put together. Um, so again, these are uh, some plots that uh, Chuck showed you, and this corresponds to various hypotheses or various ways that you would like to look at the data, um, you know, for different groups, for different metabolites, what are the changes for different diets, uh, and so on and so forth. So, so there are, this is a fairly rich data set, although as I said, one big issue that you have, and that's where potentially power analysis comes in, is that you only have 10 subjects in the control group and five subjects in the other group. So you're not really powered enough from a statistical sense. So you know, some of these changes, even if they were potentially significant, you may not be able to detect them because you don't have adequate sample size. Oops. Um, also, Chuck showed you, um, you know, these uh, maps where essentially what we are doing here, we cluster uh, metabolites into these correlation networks. And this is something uh, fairly new that we have started doing because by looking at differences in correlation, correlations or correlation patterns, what we will call in the literature correlation networks, provides additional insights. Okay, here we have an empty slide. Um, so, um, Chuck also showed you this, although he skipped this slide. So in this case, um, there is essentially what you are trying to identify is important metabolites and lipids. And we're gonna get back to what question you are asking when you are, for example, building a classificatory model tomorrow. Um, because when you see in many papers things about random forest or partially squares discriminant analysis, um, you're not trying to test a hypothesis, but you're trying really to build a predictive model. And there's a lot of confusion of when this is appropriate to do. A much simpler study where actually you have adequate number of samples is uh, uh, this study. Essentially, it involves um, three groups, 116 healthy, 60 metabolic syndrome, and 58 diabetic subjects. All of them are females. Um, and this is sort of a typical example of an untargeted data set that Maureen discussed. You have a number of named compounds. And in principle, you also have a lot of unnamed features. Uh, so tomorrow I'm gonna give you um, some hints of how in the lab we're trying to develop new bioinformatics approaches to help us name some of these unnamed features. And Alice is, Alice is also gonna talk about her, that. And you saw a poster um, out in the lunch area. So this is much simpler because in this particular case, essentially what you may be interested in is whether which metabolites are significantly differential between the healthy and the diabetic subjects or the metabolic syndrome and the diabetic subjects or which metabolites are significant across all possible comparisons. So again, which question you're asking matters a lot on which the statistical technique you're gonna use and how you're gonna formulate um, your hypothesis and how you're gonna go about it. So if you're asking a pairwise comparison, healthy versus metabolic syndrome, this is one hypothesis, but if you're asking what are the metabolites that differentiate across all three, that's a different hypothesis. So just you know, to, to, to see there are a number of subtleties, and if you are unsure, um, you know, consult somebody that has uh, worked and has experience with some of these issues. So, but before we get to all these issues, uh, you know, we need sort of to look a little bit at the data, and there have been a number of uh, presentations 
uh, and there are going to be a number of presentations later in the afternoon regarding some of these key issues. In principle, the lab, the core takes care of a number of those, but for example, if you get data from another core and you are not perfectly certain about their quality assurance, quality control procedures, um, it's good always sort of to pay attention. If your data are not well pre-processed, all downstream analysis may be contaminated. You may either get um, no results, no significant results, or you may get too many significant results that may be a complete artifact of problems during the pre-processing uh, step. So we have identification of outliers, bad spectra, uh, examine internal standards to make sure that the data are kosher. In untargeted platforms, you always have some missing data and you need to do a certain degree of imputation and obviously how you normalize data. So for example, one such issues come up when you have a very large study. Because in that case, you know, in order to acquire the data, the instrument is going to be running for a number of days and therefore you know, there might be technical issues like batch effects. The signal from one day may be stronger than the signal from another day. And that's something that you don't really want. You need to correct for that. Otherwise, you may start seeing spurious changes and believe that there is something real going on in terms of biology where that was just a technical issue, but we have technology to correct for. Uh, <clears throat> and then, um, and so I have already emphasized the importance of study design because that drives quite a bit of how you set up the statistical analysis, reprocessing issues. I'm going to focus on what I call mid-level analysis, you know, how we find differentials, um, how we use dimension reduction techniques that Chuck mentioned in his presentation, like principal component analysis or cluster analysis to get insights into the data. And then, of course, this is where everybody wants to go, more high-level analysis, like pathway enrichment, understanding potentially how these correlation networks change, that Jack mentioned, and of course, integration with other omics data. You know, at the end of the day, these are the issues that allow you to do real biology, but you need to always be aware of the whole pipeline. If anything goes wrong here, or you don't take care of pre-processing the data, Carefully, the rest doesn't quite matter. Garbage in, garbage out. And, you know, that's something that I've learned the hard way. Um, so some of the quality control checks that have been um, mentioned in other presentations is you examine the internal standards and uh, uh, there are different types of samples that we use in order sort of to, to make sure that everything is uh, good with the data, there are primary control samples that provide info about the overall quality of the run compared to previous runs. There are other control samples uh, for your particular data set. Uh, and of course, you also have the real samples, the biological samples that you're interested in analyzing. Um, <clears throat> the other issue that I briefly mentioned, and that's very nicely covered in our review paper, is that with untargeted and lipidomics platforms, you are going to have, for sure, a, a number of missing values. So at that point, you need to make a couple of key decisions. So for which metabolites or unnamed features, the number of missingness, the number of missing values from that particular feature exceeds a, a certain threshold that you feel comfortable. So for example, if you have 50% of missing values, do you really want to carry that feature in downstream analysis? Or you say, I don't want really to fill that many values. If the level of missingness is 5%, that then you move on and somehow you try to impute the data, essentially fill the missing values with some appropriate method in order to continue your analysis. So the threshold of missingness, of course, is a tricky subject because it's uh, determined by um, a lot of parameters. You know, first of all, the quality of the data, the sample size. You know, if you have hundreds and hundreds of samples, you may, you may push this threshold maybe even to 30%. But for example, for the PUFA study that Chuck presented, with 10 controls, I'll use much, much more stringent uh, threshold criteria. Essentially, I will try to minimize the amount of imputation. <clears throat> so these are some things 
but uh, uh, at least you need to be aware of and you know how you handle them. Um, there are a number of methods. Um, so essentially, with the missing data and mutation strategies, as I've already mentioned, uh, you need to decide what percentage of the main samples uh, need to be present. You know, essentially the threshold. Are you missing 5%, 10%, 30%? Where do you draw the line? Uh, the other thing that you always need, of course, to be uh, careful about is check for possible biological missingness. Essentially, in some cases, if you have sort of the healthy group and the diabetic group, one metabolite or one feature may be missing from all the samples in one group. So in that case, actually, this is very informative because essentially that metabolite is not present in one of the two groups that you are interested in analyzing. And therefore, actually, in that case, this is a very significant metabolite because it has a lot of discriminatory power. So, so whereas on the other hand, if the emission values are sort of randomly distributed over your groups, then the previous issues that I mentioned uh, come about. So once you have decided on this threshold, then uh, you remove the metabolites or the lipids or the unnamed features that don't meet that criterion, and, uh, and, then, you, oops, and then you proceed with some imputation strategy. The literature is full of different strategies. All of them have pros and cons. Uh, you know, for example, you may impute all the missing values at the minimum detection level, and that's something that the core has that information and can provide to you. Or you impute with the mean for that metabolite. For the remaining values, you have 75 values, 75% 75 of the values present. You calculate the mean, and you put that value on the remaining 25%. There are much more fancy strategies. I strongly recommend the key nearest neighbors. Um, of course, then the question is how many near, nearest neighbors to use. Essentially, what this says is you find the metabolite that is most correlated or the metabolites that are most correlated with the one that has missing values. And essentially, you use the values of the neighbors or an average of the values of k neighbors to impute that value. So in that case, essentially, you are, imp you are utilizing information about the correlation structure between your metabolites and lipids before you do the imputation. Uh, if you have very complex experimental designs, like, for example, the PUFA study that Chuck presented, there are even more model-based type of approaches, analysis of variance uh, approaches that may be most appropriate, or other fancy type of techniques that are based on dimension reduction techniques. Again, people have written dozens of papers, and there are pros and cons. But you know, um, k nearest neighbors imputation, it's for example in metabo analysis, and it's a fairly robust type of technique. But you know, again, you if you are unsure, ask an expert and um, and try to think about pros and cons. Um, in many cases, what you would like to do, and actually I recommend that, although this becomes a little bit labor intensive, try to do a little bit of a sensitivity analysis. So, you know, for example, if you put a threshold of 15% of missingness, so, you know, you only retain metabolites where they're only missing 15% of the values, um, you impute them somehow, and then you continue with your analysis, and you get a set of results a set of differential metabolites, and so forth. Um, and then you go back and say, what would have happened if you know, I retained many more features and I went to included metabolites that I needed to impute 30% of the values? How much do the results change, not only in terms of differentials, but in terms of you know, cluster analysis and so forth? So that, that tells you where things start breaking down, because if suddenly a whole bunch of results start changing when you increase the threshold of missingness, that means that you have potentially pushed your data set too far. Again, this is labor intensive because you need to do all the downstream analysis and then come back, use more features, impute, and then rerun the whole analysis. But you know, if it's you know it, it's up to you and depends on how much you would like to get out of the data. And we have a little bit of discussion in our review paper. OK, so up to this point, I just wanted you to um, 
emphasize that I just wanted to emphasize that experimental design is the most important thing. And actually, you know, from your perspective as a biologist or as a clinician, it makes life much, much simpler, both for the core and for downstream analysis to think as hard as possible about the experimental design. There are no tricks that can uh, substitute for a careful experimental design and a good power analysis. In many cases where things don't work is because the experimental design was not very carefully thought out. And yes, we have a lot of tools in our uh, toolkit that we can use, but nothing, nothing, nothing substitutes for a good experimental design. Um, I know that in some cases that's hard because you are in a more exploratory mode, but I cannot emphasize it enough. And then we can go through this QAQC uh, process and also normalization that Danu is going to present, uh, or she has potentially presented. And at this point, the data are put in the appropriate, you know, the data are properly curated, and then we are ready to start pushing with analysis. Again, I don't want to be too repetitive before lunch, but if this has not been taken care carefully, then any downstream analysis may be completely contaminated and you may reach the complete wrong conclusions. So make sure that whoever does these steps, or if you do these steps, you know, you have thought through some of these issues, and if you're uncertain, talk to an expert or consult with a core, okay? So what are the mid-level analysis topics that I would like to discuss? I'm going to emphasize quite a bit on differential analysis because this is the first thing that you would always like to address to see which metabolites are changing. Um, Chuck showed you a number of plots that were, I mentioned the words principal component analysis or cluster analysis. Essentially, this gives you a broad overview of your data. Predictive modeling is um, when you build these classificatory models. Obviously, from a systems biology perspective, you would like to get to pathway enrichment, and we're going to discuss that in detail tomorrow. And Ala has a great set of tools, and she's going to present those. I'm not going to get to time course modeling, because in many cases, you don't have that. But in the PUFA case, that's also something that you need to think about, because you have data for the same subjects at baseline, time two, time seven, time 21. <clears throat> so if you have such data, actually your modeling becomes a little bit more specialized um, in order sort of to incorporate all the information. All right, so in terms of uh, differential analysis, um, the key question that you're interested in is to identify compounds that are differentially expressed between two conditions treatment and control, disease and healthy subjects, and so forth. So I've already given you um, some examples what type of comparisons you may be interested in the PUFA uh, study. And the thing is that uh, in some of these comparisons are much more complicated because of the experimental design, whereas some other comparisons are more straightforward. Um, so a little bit in terms of the mechanics, you know, you need to, to think which question you're asking. That's when you formulate the hypothesis. And then there are some technical, technical aspects. You know, if you believe that your data after normalization and processing and so forth, more or less follow a normal distribution, then you go with the usual, the good old uh, two sample t test. On the other hand, if the data strongly violate this assumption, um, then this may not be particularly appropriate. So you may need to resort to robust alternatives. And you may have heard about the rank sum test, also known as the Wilcoxon test. All of them are minor variants, and so forth. Um, and the reason is that, you know, in, the, the reason is that if you have strong violations of some of these assumptions, one of these tests may show that a metabolite or an important metabolite may be differential, but this is because of violation of these assumptions, and you would like sort of to, to avoid um, 
these things happen. You don't want to declare significance for something that was for particular technical reasons. Um, <clears throat> so in the Swan study, things are much simpler because, again, we only have three groups. We have a much simpler design. So for example, you're interested in healthy versus diabetic. And what does the null hypothesis mean? It means that the means of the particular metabolites that you would like to test are equal. Whereas in the alternative hypothesis, um, again, you need to be careful of how you formulate the alternative hypothesis. There are some differences of what the corresponding p-values are going to look like if your alternative says that the means are different. So you're agnostic about the direction of the difference, whether the diabetic have higher levels than the healthy controls, or whether you have some prior information and you believe that a particular metabolite has to be higher in the diabetic, so you formulate the alternative and therefore the corresponding testing procedure somewhat differently. If you don't have that prior information, you go always with a more agnostic alternative that the means are different. And always keep an eye in checking for uh, whether the data are normal because in that case, t-tests are perfectly valid. If you have very strong violations, then t-tests are not the most appropriate, and then you need to use a more robust variant. So, <clears throat> yes, is there a question? Yeah, in a, in a case like, because the last, this one has like three groups, right? Yes. So in a case like this, um, you'd probably do an ANOVA or? Yes, we're gonna jump to that in four slides. Okay. And one more question. Sure. Um, so with, if you're, if you're agnostic about the direction of your, your thing, would you do a two-tail t-test? Yeah, this is exactly the two-tail test. So the question was, for this one, we have three groups. Again, if you have many groups, you can always <clears throat> break them down into a whole slew of pair comparisons. So, you know, with three groups, you can do three pairwise comparisons using t-tests. Healthy versus diabetic, healthy versus metabolic syndrome, diabetic versus metabolic syndrome. <clears throat> and in this particular case, given the fact that I'm adequately powered, I have hundreds or dozens of samples in each condition, uh, probably the results are not gonna be very, very different. However, if you have very few samples, there is a much more efficient way, and I'm gonna show you an example of how I would set up such a model for the PUFA study called analysis of variance, where you utilize all the data together, and therefore, in some sense, for the variance parameters, and I'm gonna explain that in a second, you borrow strength by utilizing your entire data set. Um, so here is the results um, for just to showcase. So for example, this may be a little bit of a suspect metabolite in terms of the, um, normality assumption. These are something known as the quantile-quantile plot. And you see, if this hugs your data, which are the blue dots, hug tightly the red line, that means that the normality assumption holds very well. Here, you may get a little bit concerned because you have a little bit of violation. There are some strong outliers. It may be a little bit disconcerting, but not completely alarming. If, on the other hand, your data, the blue dots look like this, and therefore they're nowhere close to the red line, then forget about the t-test because essentially this is a completely wrong test to use and you need to resort to um, some robust alternative like the rank sum or Wilcoxon test and so forth. Um, so let me make a, a, a comment about, um, you know, what is the idea behind this t-test? Probably all of you have used them, you have used the output. So there are two pieces that go into when, whenever you have a testing procedure. Essentially, the hypothesis says that we are testing the mean levels in the two conditions, the diabetic and the healthy, let's say, for a particular metabolite. So this one metabolite and this some other compound. So essentially, here we see a fairly strong difference of the mean levels that are indicated by this line in the box plot. But you may still not have a, a significant, statistically significant differential metabolite because variance also plays an important role. You know, 
So for example, imagine a situation where this green box plot is down here and the purple box plot is up there. Then this is a very, very pronounced effect. On the other hand, here the effect is, as we can see, the p-value is, uh, in both cases, um, fairly strong because the variances are not overwhelming, do not overwhelm the differences in the, the variability in the, uh, the data that you have in the two groups doesn't overwhelm the differences that you have. So, so that's why you would like sort of to pre-process and normalize your data appropriately because if you haven't done that, either you have, that's why the normalization step is important, either you induce artificial changes because of very technical reasons, as I mentioned, drifts over different days when the data were acquired, or your variances are not well controlled, and therefore that may kill the statistical significance. So all of these things are tied together. That's why doing the pre-processing steps and making sure that you, know, you have carefully normalized your data is important because otherwise you either get, again, artificial differential results or you don't show any differences, although biologically they may have been supported. Um, so what would happen if um, you, you have many, many groups and you are trying to do all these pairwise comparisons? So the difference between a t-test that only looks at two groups at a time versus a more fancy modeling approach, which is the analysis of variance, is that the way you estimate, so here the way you estimate the variances that are going to go into your testing procedure, um, you calculate the variance for the data for this group and the data for that group, and then you plug them in your testing procedure. On the other hand, if you were doing multiple comparisons, these variances across all comparisons that you are doing for the same metabolite essentially are estimated by using all the data that you are considering, let's say from three groups, and that's where you borrow strength and you tighten your results. So that's why you need to be aware that with complex experimental designs, in many cases, you are much better off, and especially if you don't have adequate sample size, to go with more fancy procedures because that allows you to borrow strength across all, all your groups for the variance parameter, not for the mean parameter. Uh, oops. Okay. <clears throat> so here we go. Um, for the SWAN data, essentially, um, the design is fairly simple. So by doing these pairwise comparisons, and probably you're going to find most of the things that uh, um, you're interested in. But the PUFA study is a completely different story. You see, it's a multifactorial design because let's think about what the factors are. You have <clears throat> uh, the control subjects versus the NFLD subjects. So that's one of your factors that can induce changes and you may be interested in. And you also have the diet, the PUFA versus the carb diet. Actually, there is a third component, which is also time that makes things even more complicated. And therefore, even if we didn't have time, essentially, we have four groups that you may want to compare. We have the control group with the PUFA diet, the control group with the carb diet, the NFLD group with the PUFA diet and then FLD group with a carb diet. And again, depends on which changes would you like sort of to see. And remember that here, at the end of the day, we have only 15 subjects. So if you start breaking all these um, comparisons by using t-tests, essentially you're not utilizing efficiently the data. If you had hundreds of subjects in the control and the NFLD, then you would be perfectly fine because, you know, you are adequately powered and therefore you may not need to do something more fancy. So, so if we think about uh, what are the possible strategies, I think I've already mentioned that, you know, you would like to identify, let's say, comparisons of interest, the PUFA diet versus the CARB diet for the controls. So right now you start conditioning on the level of the other factor. And then you can use um, t-tests or more robust versions and so on and so forth. There is a slew 
of tests again in the literature and also implementing metabo analysts that allow you to compare two groups. But this is the key point that I've already mentioned a number of times. You start losing efficiency quickly due to limited sample size. If this was not an issue, you know, you can afford maybe doing all these pairwise comparisons. The second strategy is where you really utilize and leverage the complex experimental design and you put all things together. So just to give you a flavor, uh, let's say that this is the expression level of a particular metabolite for subjects in condition J. So this is one of our factors. So control versus NFLD, this is my first factor. And diet K, which essentially has three levels, the baseline before people were, before subjects were put on the PUFA diet, the PUFA level and the CARB level. So that tells you how complex the design is. So essentially what an ANOVA model says is what gives rise to the data that you observed on average. So the story behind ANOVA says that for all these conditions that we're examining, there is a mean level. And this mean level is modulated by these two factors. So let's say that the NFLD condition moves the mean level for glucose up. So essentially, in that case, you're going to have a positive coefficient in this type of model. This you can think of it as a regression model. So essentially, that's how you represent the mean level for glucose for the NFLD subjects, because from the grand mean across all 15 subjects, it moves up under this condition. And let's say that the diet factor negatively affects, uh, you know, for the PUFA diet, negatively affects um, the mean level. So in that case, you know, this factor raises the level, the other lowers the level, and essentially you can model simultaneously across all four conditions, or actually six conditions, two times three, the data uh, by just building this simple model. Then the main, of course, then you will ask, okay, um, how do we do the testing? Then essentially what you test is the coefficients for these factors, and therefore automatically, if you look whether this coefficient is different than zero, it means that that's how you pick out the difference between the control and the NFLD, and similar for the diet factor. But the main thing is that you have integrated through this model all your 15 subjects, and you don't keep breaking into two subgroups where you start losing power. Because, so, so that's the main uh, advantage of such models. On the other hand, these models, you know, have much more difficult or complicated mechanics. And again, you need to be careful of how you use them. You know, something that I like to tell students when I teach these classes is there is no free lunch. You know, everything comes with a price. Here, the complexity of the model requires more careful technical treatment, but in many cases, this is the only way to really process the data and identify changes because of all the issues that we have already described. Uh, <clears throat> so here, what I'm, I'm saying is I'm doing a little bit of calculations. Those of you that have seen ANOVAs, these are, seem, we should be very familiar, but essentially telling you how many uh, data points I have and where essentially you borrow strength by considering a more fancy model and that allows you to calibrate the p-values much better than just fragmenting your data and doing the p, uh, the t tests. On the other hand, again, there is no free lunch. When you start postulating such models, you start making assumptions. You know, when you just run, let's say, a rank sum test, essentially you have the minimum set of assumptions. When you run a t-test, you make the assumption that your data are normally distributed. Here, you are making a number of additional assumptions, not only the normality assumption of your data, but also uh, statistically dependent assumptions that are important for calibrating the p-values of how the factors interact, and also about the variances. So, you know, if you believe that some of this, or you do some diagnostics and there is a whole literature of how you do these diagnostics, strongly violate some of these assumptions, this may not be a good approach to take. So, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to sort of to warn you of what are sort of important issues that you always need to be aware 
or when somebody brings results to you and says, okay, that's what I did and this is the best answer out there, you know, there are a number of assumptions going be be behind every type of analysis. And everything is driven by the study design. That's, that's the other important thing. So that's why thinking about the study design before even you collect the data, your samples, is important. Um, so there are extensions in the literature and therefore the, the key message is that you always need to weigh pros and cons of various strategies and what you're trying to get out of your data. You know. All right, any questions? <clears throat> All right, so, so the take home message is that, um, again, in the complex setting with a limited sample size, uh, you would like to sort of take full advantage of the data by building appropriate models. And if you are unsure about some of these issues, um, it's advisable sort of to, to talk to an expert. There are a number of subtle issues uh, here. Um, the other thing that <clears throat> when we talked about such type of models, you don't take into consideration any of background information that you may have on the subjects, which if you had taken into consideration all this information, um, a metabolite that showed strongly differential in your analysis may not be because, uh, for example, that may have been driven by differences in the clinical status of the patients. So in many cases, what we do, and that's what we have done in the PUF analysis that Chuck was showing you, we have already adjusted the levels of metabolites by building even more fancy models than this one, where we have thrown all these background characteristics as additional terms. <clears throat> so, um, so again, it depends on how much information you have, but if you believe that, um, so, so essentially what, this information helps you do is uh, counter heterogeneity. You know, if you're doing a mouse experiment or a cell line experiment, you know, all your cell lines are prepared exactly the same. So you have, no, you have very homogeneous data. So the only things that matter are these factors. On the other hand, when you do deal with human subjects, and especially if they don't come from carefully randomized experiments, you may have a lot of heterogeneity, for example, in the age distribution. So one of your groups, for whatever reason, may just happen to be comprised of young people and the other of old people. And therefore, that may confound the results because you may believe that the diet was the key factor, but actually age was also contributing and you haven't sort of corrected for that factor. So again, when you're dealing with uh, subjects, sorry, studies that involve human subjects, this is something that if you have that information, you need sort of to incorporate it in your model. So don't just go directly to the test. You need sort of to uh, adjust for background characteristics because they may be a driving force behind some of the differentials that you may identify if you didn't take this information into consideration. For mouse or cell line experiments and so forth, everything is kosher because you don't have heterogeneity. Yes. Okay, questions. So when you uh, talk about the drawbacks, mm -hmm. you mentioned there might be, uh, so the factors might not be independent. So yeah. can you uh, incorporate the interacting effect into the ANOVA? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Well, that's for, that's for that's what I said. I mean, you know, I can give a 15-week course on ANOVA and all its uh, variants, but this is sort of a, a subject that has been studied for the last 50 years. So again, if you believe that for your data and your design, these issues come up, um, people have thought about these issues. They have developed techniques. They are not available in metabo analyst. You need to go to more sophisticated statistical software where these things are um, implemented, but there are answers. What I'm trying sort of here to do is just walk you through particular case studies, identify key issues, show you what things are easily available that you can use, and to make you aware that 
if you believe that some of these issues are relevant for your uh, for your study, uh, talk to an expert. You know, at least to make sure that everything sort of properly processed and analyzed. So here is the other big issue that all of you are aware by reading biological papers. You know how we go, uh, how we fix or correct the results for the multiple hypothesis or comparison testing problem. So remember that here we are doing uh, lots of tests because we have lots of metabolites. So even in a simple t-test case, for the SWAN data, I'm having 264 named metabolites. So when I compare the diabetic from the healthy subjects, I'm going to run 264 tests. So <clears throat> I know this is just before lunch, but uh, so remember that we have formulated, and you have probably heard at some point about type 1 and type 2 errors in hypothesis testing, but this gives you a little bit of context of you know, what the issue is and why you need sort of to address it. So um, one type of error that you know, comes up in this testing is what we call as type 1 error. And this is where we say that we control the test at the 5% level when people present the result. Because the null hypothesis is true, <clears throat> and you reject it. OK? So these are the false positives. And then the other type of error is the type uh, 2 error, denoted by another Greek letter, where the null hypothesis is false, and you don't reject it. So the, you, the problem is that you cannot minimize both at the same time. That's why you need to control one and optimize the other. And that's very standard. Uh, but, oops. Uh, and this is, has nothing just to do with the metabolomics. No lomics platforms. This is something that you need to address. Actually, in other platforms like RNA-seq and so forth, you are not doing just hundreds of comparisons, but you're doing thousands or tens of thousands of comparisons. Um, so, and that's the point. With the target approach, for example, you may do dozens or hundreds of hypothesis tests where with an untargeted, if you also incorporate all the unnamed features, you may be carrying out thousands of tests. So what I'm trying to show here is that uh, the upshot here is that at the end of the day, when you start running a lot of tests, this factor, because alpha is less than one is uh, less than one, so this factor is less than one. So when you raise it into a power, this goes to zero. So essentially, the probability of making at least one error in M tests goes to one. So after 80 tests, for sure you are making errors. So the question is, you cannot eliminate that fact of life, but the question is, you know, how you can control it. And <clears throat> the, the, the idea is how sort of to put a bound on the number of false positives. So, so that's, at the end of the day, the, the, the issue that comes up by making, doing so many tests. And here you need sort of to control this quantity V. So if you're having, you're doing, you're having a very small target task, and therefore you're only looking at 20 metabolites, this is what people have been doing for the last 100 years, where you're trying sort of to control the probability of false positives um, across all your 20 tests. But this starts breaking down when you're doing hundreds of tests because essentially then you become too conservative and essentially you don't declare anything significant. So that's the problem here. So if you have a very small assay, this is a very reasonable approach. But if you have larger assays or, for example, untargeted approaches, you need to move to the more modern approach that controls the expected proportion of false positives, not the probability that of false positives, because you know this is cannot be really well controlled if you have hundreds of tests. I know it's before lunch, and don't worry about too much about the algebra. So, and again, so the FWER is much much more conservative, and therefore, if you have a small assay, because you are not sort of doing a large profiling you may want to guard against any false positives. So that's why you may be much, much more stringent. On the other hand, with an untargeted platform, or if you are using RNA-seq data or 
you are doing a GWAS study and so forth, there is no way that you can control that quantity. So essentially, you are trying sort of to control the expected proportion, and that's where the relative, relevant quantity is FDR. So when you read the literature, it's not necessarily that FDR is the default if somebody, for example, is doing a small validation study. So, <clears throat> so here I'm, I'm, I'm sort of showing you uh, just an example from uh, another study of uh, Chucks and you know the percent of change. So this is sort of the full change in some sense, the corresponding p values, and so on and so forth. Um, so if we look at uh, the Swan study, we see that we didn't have very strong differentials because essentially you are looking at how many differentials you have that have strong p-values without taking into consideration this multiple comparisons uh, problem. But still, many of these differentials, you know, given the fact that as we've seen, you do a lot of tests, many of them also are going to be uh, false positives if you ignore this issue. So that's where we do this type of adjustments and this is something that you have seen probably in papers, the FDR Benjamini Hochberg adjustment, but essentially you adjust the level of the p-values appropriately, and there is, um, actually I have the formula in the appendix of my slides, and essentially you see that there are, once you do things properly, there are very, very few differentials with p-values or adjusted p-values less than 10%. So essentially, in the Swan study, there is, the signal is fairly weak, per metabolite. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm sorting sort of another way of looking at um, this picture. Oops. Sorry. So here I'm plotting, I'm sorting the p-values, and essentially here I have the metabolites with very small p-values, and here I have the metabolites the raw p-values with very high ones. So essentially, if you didn't know anything about multiple comparisons and all the issues that uh, come with them, essentially you're gonna draw a straight line here at the 5% level, okay? And you're gonna say that all these metabolites, which are about 25, which is exactly compatible with the frequency less than 0.5, these are about 25, 28, you're gonna declare those significant. However, what these adjustments do is essentially, instead of just drawing a flat line, the line that you control for your significance is a function of the number of tests that you perform, and this is a line that corresponds of controlling the FDR level at 5% or controlling the FDR level at 10%. So that's why, essentially, that becomes much more stringent because the straight line would have been up to here and include about 30 metabolites. But incorporating the information of multiple comparisons, essentially, oops, we get to this result that essentially we have three or four metabolites differential at the 10% level after adjustment for multiple comparisons. So on the other hand, if we were doing and FWR controlling the family-wide zero rate, essentially for this study you would have called zero differential metabolites because of the conservative nature of that approach. So the take-home message here is that multiple comparisons matter and you have to address it. And uh, you know, if you don't address it, you are a good chunk of your results and you can do the explicit calculations are provably false positives. And the more the bigger your assay is, for example, in untargeted approaches, the more significant the problem becomes, and therefore the more false positives you declare unless you address this issue. There is very mature technology implementing many statistical software packages that overcomes this issue. This has been addressed carefully in the theoretical literature, so all these are very kosher, and right now it's just a matter of being aware and making the appropriate comparisons. Um, and on that note, I think it's time for lunch. Two quick things. Are there uh, any questions, first yeah. of all? First of all, please ask questions. Yes. 
So I, I don't know if this is outside the scope of right now, if I should talk to you later, but <clears throat> in terms of like mice, um, there's always like cage effects or some other effect that they say is there. Um, how do you correct for that? <clears throat> do you have that information? My cages? Yeah. Yes. So in that case, the first thing to do is, what's the other thing that I haven't emphasized enough here given the positive for time? Always plot your data and see, try to visualize as much as possible your data and see if the cage effect, I mean, you know, somebody said that the cage effect may be important, but see if it really matters for your study. If suddenly it strongly matters for your study, then you can sort of extend the factor, the ANOVA model by putting um, an additional variable that says, you know, which mice belong to this cage, which mice for that cage, and essentially it's like adjusting for age, by the example that I gave. Okay. On the other hand, if you don't see this making a difference as you plot and try to visualize the data, you know, visualizing the data is very, very important. That's why uh, packages like Metabo Analysts are very helpful because they start, you start getting a gut feeling of where the changes are, what is going in your data, whether you have outliers. And then in order to formalize and rigorize the results, you start getting to this type of analysis. Next question. No other question? Okay, Ala has announcements. So uh, a couple of things. Okay, so first of all, um, the slides that George was showing were loaded into your uh, day two folder.